Section four of the Trembling of a Leaf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lily Brander. The Trembling of a Leaf by W. Somerset Maugham. Section four. The Fall of Edward Barnard. Part one. Bateman Hunter slept badly. For a fortnight on the boat that brought him from Tahiti to San Francisco, he had been thinking of the story he had to tell. And for three days on the train, he had repeated to himself the words in which he meant to tell it. But in a few hours now, he would be in Chicago, and doubts assailed him. His conscience, always very sensitive, was not at ease. He was uncertain that he had done all that was possible. It was on his honour to do much more than the possible, and the thought was disturbing that, in a matter which so nearly touched his own interest, he had allowed his interest to prevail over his quisotry. Self-sacrifice appealed so keenly to his imagination that the inability to exercise it gave him a sense of disillusion. He was like the philanthropist who, with altruistic motives, builds model dwellings for the poor, and finds that he has made a lucrative investment. He cannot prevent the satisfaction he feels in the ten percent which rewards the bread he had cast upon the waters, but he has an awkward feeling that it detracts somewhat from the savour of his virtue. Bateman Hunter knew that his heart was pure, but he was not quite sure how steadfastly, when he told her his story, he would endure the scrutiny of Isabel Longstaff's cool grey eyes. They were far-seeing and wise. She measured the standards of others by her own meticulous uprightness, and there could be no greater censure than the cold silence with which she expressed her disapproval of a conduct that did not satisfy her exacting code. There was no appeal from her judgment, for, having made up her mind, she never changed it. But Bateman would not have had her different. He loved not only the beauty of her person, slim and strict, with the proud carriage of her head, but still more the beauty of her soul, with her truthfulness, her rigid sense of honour, her fearless outlook. She seemed to him to collect in herself all that was most admirable in his country women. But he saw in her something more than the perfect type of the American girl, he felt that her exquisiteness was peculiar in a way to her environment, and he was assured that no city in the world could have produced her but Chicago. A pang seized him when he remembered that he must deal so bitter a blow to her pride, and anger flamed up in his heart when he thought of Edward Barnard. But at last the train steamed in to Chicago, and he exulted when he saw the long streets of grey houses. He could hardly bear his impatience at the thought of State and Wabash with their crowded pavements, their hustling traffic, and their noise. He was at home, and he was glad that he had been born in the most important city in the United States. San Francisco was provincial, New York was effete. The future of America lay in the development of its economic possibilities, and Chicago, by its position, and by the energy of its citizens, was destined to become the real capital of the country. I guess I shall live long enough to see it the biggest city in the world, Bateman said to himself as he stepped down to the platform. His father had come to meet him, and after a hearty handshake, the pair of them, tall, slender, and well-made, with the same fine ascetic features and thin lips, walked out of the station. Mr. Hunter's automobile was waiting for them, and they got in. Mr. Hunter caught his son's proud and happy glance as he looked at the street. Glad to be back, son? he asked. I should just think I was, said Bayman. His eyes devoured the restless scene. I guess there's a bit more traffic here than in your South Sea Island, laughed mr hunter do you like it there give me chicago dad answered bateman you haven't brought edward barnard back with you no how was he bateman was silent for a moment and his handsome sensitive face darkened i'd sooner not speak about him dad 
he said at last. That's all right, my son. I guess your mother will be a happy woman today. They passed out of the crowded streets in the loop and drove along the lake till they came to the imposing house, an exact copy of a chateau on the Loire, which Mr. Hunter had built himself some years before. As soon as Bateman was alone in his room, he asked for a number on the telephone. His heart leaped when he heard the voice that answered him. "'Good morning, Isabel,' he said gaily. "'Good morning, Bateman.' "'How did you recognize my voice?' "'It is not so long since I heard it last. Besides, I was expecting you. When may I see you?' "'Unless you have anything better to do, perhaps you'll die with us tonight.' You know very well that I couldn't possibly have anything better to do. I suppose that you are full of news. He thought he detected in her voice a note of apprehension. Yes, he answered. Well, you must tell me tonight. Goodbye. She ran off. It was characteristic of her that she should be able to wait so many unnecessary hours to know what so immensely concerned her. To Bateman there was an admirable fortitude in her restraint. At dinner, at which beside himself and Isabel, no one was present but her father and mother. He watched her guide the conversation into the channels of an urbane small talk, and it occurred to him that in just such a manner would a marquise under the shadow of the guillotine toy with the affairs of a day that would know no morrow. Her delicate features, the aristocratic shortness of her upper lip, and her wealth of fair hair suggested the marquise again and it must have been obvious even if it were not notorious that in her veins flowed the best blood in chicago the dining-room was a fitting frame to her fragile beauty for isabel had caused the house a replica of a palace on the grand canal at venice to be furnished by an english expert in the style of louis fifteen and the graceful decoration linked with the name of that amorous monarch enhanced her loveliness and at the same time acquired from it a more profound significance for isabel's mind was richly stored and her conversation however light was never flippant she spoke now of the musicale to which she and her mother had been in the afternoon of the lectures which an english poet was giving at the auditorium of the political situation and of the old master which her father had recently bought for fifty thousand dollars in new york he comforted bateman to hear her he felt that he was once more in the civilized world at the centre of culture and distinction and certain voices troubling and yet against his will refusing to steal their clamour were at last silent in his heart gee but it's good to be back in chicago he said at last dinner was over and when they went out of the dining-room isabel said to her mother i'm going to take bateman along to my den we have various things to talk about very well my dear said mrs longstaff you'll find your father and me in the madame du barry room when you're through isabel led the young man upstairs and showed him into the room of which he had so many charming memories though he knew it so well he could not repress the exclamation of delight which it always wrung from him she looked round with a smile i think it's a success she said the main thing is that it's right there's not even an ashtray that isn't of the period i suppose that's what makes it so wonderful like all you do is so superlatively right they sat down in front of a log fire and isabel looked at him with calm grave eyes now what have you to say to me she asked i hardly know how to begin is edward barnard coming back no there was a long silence before bateman spoke again and with each of them it was filled with many thoughts it was a difficult story he had to tell for there were things in it which were so offensive to her sensitive ears that he could not bear to tell them and yet, in justice to her, no less than in justice to himself, he must tell her the whole truth. He had all begun long ago, when he and Edward Barnard, still at college, had met Isabel Longstaff at the tea party given to introduce her to society. They had both known her when she was a child, 
and their long-legged boys but for two years she had been in europe to finish her education and it was with a surprised delight that they renewed acquaintance with the lovely girl who returned both of them fell desperately in love with her but bateman saw quickly that she had eyes only for edward and devoted to his friend he resigned himself to the role of confidant he passed bitter moments but he could not deny that edward was worthy of his good fortune and anxious that nothing should impair the friendship he so greatly valued he took care never by a hint to disclose his own feelings in six months the young couple were engaged but they were very young and isabel's father decided that they should not marry at least till edward graduated they had to wait a year bateman remembered the winter at the end of which isabel and edward were to be married a winter of dances and theatre parties and of informal gaieties at which he the constant third was always present he loved her no less because she would shortly be his friend's wife her smile a gay word she flung him the confidence of her affection never ceased to delight him and he congratulated himself somewhat complacently because he did not envy them their happiness then an accident happened a great bank failed there was a panic on the exchange and edward warner's father found himself a ruined man he came home one night told his wife that he was penniless and after dinner, going into his study, shot himself. A week later, Edward Barnard, with a tired, white face, went to Isabel and asked her to release him. Her only answer was to throw her arms round his neck and burst into tears. Don't make it harder for me, sweet, he said. Do you think I can let you go now? I love you. How can I ask you to marry me? The whole thing's hopeless. Your father would never let you. I haven't a cent. What do I care? I love you. He told her his plans. He had to earn money at once, and George Brown Schmidt, an old friend of his family, had offered to take him into his own business. He was a South Sea merchant, and he had agencies in many of the islands of the Pacific. He had suggested that Edward should go to Tahiti for a year or two where, under the best of his managers, he could learn the details of that varied trade, and at the end of that time, he promised the young man a position in Chicago. It was a wonderful opportunity, and when he had finished his explanations, Isabel was once more all smiles. You foolish boy, why have you been trying to make me miserable? His face lit up at her words, and his eyes flashed. Isabel, you don't mean to say you wait for me. Don't you think you're worth it? She smiled. Ah, don't laugh at me now. I beseech you to be serious. It may be for two years. Have no fear. I love you, Edward. When you come back, I will marry you. Edward's employer was a man who did not like delay, and he had told him that if he took the post he offered, he must sail that day week from San Francisco. Edward spent his last evening with Isabel. It was after dinner that Mr. Longstaff, saying he wanted a word with Edward, took him into the smoking room. Mr. Longstaff had accepted good-naturedly the arrangement which his daughter had told him of, and Edward could not imagine what mysterious communication he had now to make. He was not a little perplexed to see that his host was embarrassed. He faltered. He talked of trivial things. At last, he blurted it out. I guess you've heard of Arnold Jackson, he said, looking at Edward with a frown. Edward hesitated. His natural truthfulness obliged him to admit a knowledge he would gladly have been able to deny. Yes, I have. But it's a long time ago. I guess I didn't pay very much attention there are not many people in chicago who haven't heard of arnold jackson said mr longstaff bitterly and if there are they'll have no difficulty in finding someone who will be glad to tell them do you know he was mrs longstaff's brother yes i knew that of course we've had no communication with him for many years 
he left the country as soon as he was able to and i guess the country wasn't sorry to see the last of him we understand he lives in tahiti my advice to you is to give him a wide berth but if you do hear anything about him mrs longstaff and i would be very glad if you'd let us know sure that was all i wanted to say to you now i dare say you'd like to join the ladies there are few families that have not among their members one whom if their neighbours permitted they would willingly forget and they are fortunate when the lapse of a generation or two had infested his vagaries with a romantic glamour but when he is actually alive if his peculiarities are not of the kind that can be condoned by the phrase he is nobody's enemy but his own a safe one when the culprit has no worse to answer for than alcoholism or wandering affections the only possible cause is silence and it was this which the longstaffs had adopted towards arnold jackson they never talked of him they would not even pass through the street in which he had lived too kind to make his wife and children suffer for his misdeeds they had supported them for years but on the understanding that they should live in europe they did everything they could to blot out all recollection of arnold jackson and yet were conscious that the story was as fresh in the public mind as when first the scandal burst upon a gaping world arnold jackson was as black a sheep as any family could suffer from a wealthy banker prominent in his church a philanthropist a man respected by all not only for his connections in his veins ran the blue blood of chicago but also for his upright character he was arrested one day on a charge of fraud and the dishonesty which the trial brought to light was not of the sort which could be explained by a sudden temptation it was deliberate and systematic arnold jackson was a rogue when he was sent to the penitentiary for seven years there were few who did not think he had escaped lightly when at the end of this last evening the lovers separated it was with many protestations of devotion isabel all tears was consoled a little by her certainty of edward's passionate love it was a strange feeling that she had it made her wretched to part from him and yet she was happy because he adored her this was more than two years ago he had written to her by every mail since then twenty-four letters in all for the mail went but once a month and his letters had been all that a lover's letters should be they were intimate and charming humorous sometimes especially of late and tender at first they suggested that he was homesick they were full of his desire to get back to chicago in isabel and a little anxiously she wrote begging him to persevere she was afraid that he might throw up his opportunity and come racing back she did not want her lover to lack endurance and she quoted to him the lines i could not love thee dear so much loved her not honour more but presently he seemed to settle down and it made isabel very happy to observe his growing enthusiasm to introduce american methods into that forgotten corner of the world but she knew him and at the end of the year which was the shortest time he could possibly stay in tahiti she expected to have to use all her influence to dissuade him from coming home it was much better that he should learn the business thoroughly and if they had been able to wait a year there seemed no reason why they should not wait another she talked it over with bateman hunter always the most generous of friends during those first few days after edward went she did not know what she would have done without him and they decided that edward's future must stand before everything it was with relief that she found as the time passed that he made no suggestion of returning he's splendid isn't he she exclaimed to bateman he's white through and through reading between the lines of his letter i know he hates it over there but he's sticking it out because she blushed a little and bateman with the grave smile which was so attractive in him finished the sentence for her because he loves you it makes me feel so humble she said you're wonderful isabel you're perfectly wonderful 
but the second year passed and every month isabel continued to receive a letter from edward and presently it began to seem a little strange that he did not speak of coming back he wrote as though he were settled definitely in tahiti and what was more comfortably settled she was surprised then she read his letters again all of them several times and now reading between the lines indeed she was puzzled to notice a change which had escaped her the later letters were as tender and as delightful as the first but the tone was different she was vaguely suspicious of their humour and she had instinctive mistrust of her sex for that unaccountable quality and she discerned in them now a flippancy which perplexed her she was not quite certain that the edward who wrote to her now was the same edward that she had known one afternoon the day after a mail had arrived from tahiti when she was driving with bateman he said to her did edward tell you when he was sailing no he didn't mention it i thought he might have said something to you about it not a word you know what edward is she laughed in reply he has no sense of time if it occurs to you next time you write you might ask him when he's thinking of coming her manner was so unconcerned that only bateman's acute sensitiveness could have discerned in her request a very urgent desire he laughed lightly yes i ask him i can't imagine what he's thinking about a few days later meeting him again she noticed that something troubled him they had been much together since edward left chicago they were both devoted to him and each in his desire to talk of the absent one found a willing listener the consequence was that isabel knew every expression of bateman's face and his denials now were useless against her keen instinct something told her that his harassed look had to do with edward and she did not rest till she had made him confess the fact is he said at last i heard in a roundabout way that edward was no longer working for brown schmidt and company and yesterday i took the opportunity to ask mr brown schmidt himself well edward left his employment with them nearly a year ago how strange he should have said nothing about it bateman hesitated but he had gone so far now that he was obliged to tell the rest it made him feel dreadfully embarrassed he was fired in heaven's name what for it appears they warned him once or twice and at last they told him to get out they say he was lazy and incompetent edward they were silent for a while and then he saw that isabel was crying instinctively he seized her hand oh my dear don't don't he said i can't bear to see it she was so unstrung that she let her hand rest in his he tried to console her it's incomprehensible isn't it it's so unlike edward i can't help feeling there must be some mistake she did not say anything for a while and when she spoke it was hesitatingly has it struck you that there was anything queer in his letters lately she asked looking away her eyes all bright with tears he did not quite know how to answer i have noticed a change in them he admitted he seems to have lost that high seriousness which i admired so much in him one would almost think that the things that matter well don't matter isabel did not reply she was vaguely uneasy perhaps in his answer to your letter he'll say when he's coming home all we can do is to wait for that another letter came from edward for each of them and still he made no mention of his return but when he wrote he could not have received baseman's enquiry the next mail would bring them an answer to that the next mail came and bateman brought isabel the letter he had just received but the first glance of his face was enough to tell her that he was disconcerted she read it through carefully and then with slightly tightened lips read it again it's a very strange letter she said i don't quite understand it one might almost think that he was joshing me said bateman flushing it reads like that but it must be unintentional 
that's so unlike edward he said nothing about coming back if i weren't so confident of his love i should think i hardly know what i should think it was then that bateman had broached the scheme which during the afternoon had formed itself in his brain the firm founded by his father in which he was now a partner a firm which manufactured all manner of motor vehicles was about to establish agencies in honolulu sydney and wellington and bateman proposed that he himself should go instead of the manager who had been suggested he could return by tahiti in fact travelling from wellington it was inevitable to do so and he could see edward there's some mystery and i'm going to clear it up that's the only way to do it oh bateman how can you be so good and kind she exclaimed you know there's nothing in the world i want more than your happiness isabel she looked at him and she gave him her hands you're wonderful bateman i didn't know there was any one in the world like you how can i ever thank you i don't want your thanks i only want to be allowed to help you she dropped her eyes and flushed a little she was so used to him that she had forgotten how handsome he was he was as tall as edward and as well made but he was dark and pale of face while edward was ruddy of course she knew he loved her it touched her she felt very tenderly towards him it was from this journey that bateman hunter was now returned the business part of it took him somewhat longer than he expected and he had much time to think of his two friends he had come to the conclusion that it could be nothing serious that prevented edward from coming home a pride perhaps which made him determined to make good before he claimed the bride he adored but it was a pride that must be reasoned with isabel was unhappy edward must come back to chicago with him and marry her at once a position could be found for him in the works of the hunter motor traction and automobile company bateman with a bleeding heart exulted at the prospect of giving happiness to the two persons he loved best in the world at the cost of his own he would never marry he would be godfather to the children of edward and isabel and many years later when they were both dead he would tell isabel's daughter how long long ago he had loved her mother bateman's eyes were veiled with tears when he pictured this scene to himself meaning to take edward by surprise he had not cabled to announce his arrival and when at last he landed at tahiti he allowed a youth who said he was the son of the house to lead him to the hotel de la fleur he chuckled when he thought of his friend's amazement on seeing him the most unexpected of visitors walk into his office by the way he asked as they went along can you tell me where i shall find mr edward barnard barnard said the youth i seem to know the name he's an american a tall fellow with light brown hair and blue eyes he's been here over two years of course now i know who you mean you mean mr jackson's nephew whose nephew mr arnold jackson i don't think we're speaking of the same person answered bateman frigidly he was startled it was queer that arnold jackson known apparently to all and sundry should live here under the disgraceful name in which he had been convicted but bateman could not imagine whom he was that he passed off as his nephew mrs longstaff was his only sister and he had never had a brother the young man by his side talked volubly in an english that had something in it of the intonation of a foreign tongue and bateman with a sidelong glance saw what he had not noticed before that there was in him a good deal of native blood a touch of hauteur involuntarily entered into his manner they reached the hotel when he had arranged about his room bateman asked to be directed to the premises of brown schmidt and company they were on the front facing the lagoon and glad to feel the solid earth under his feet after eight days at sea he sauntered down the sunny road to the water's edge having found the place he sought bateman sent in his cart to the manager and was led through a lofty barn-like room half store and half warehouse to an office in which sat a stout spectacled bald-headed man can you tell me where i shall find mr edward barnard 
I understand he was in this office for some time. That is so. I don't know just where he is. But I thought he came here with a particular recommendation from Mr. Braunschmidt. I know Mr. Braunschmidt very well. The fat man looked at Bateman with shrilled, suspicious eyes. He called to one of the boys in the warehouse. Say, Henry, where's Barnard now? Do you know? He's working at Cameron's, I think, came the answer from someone who did not trouble to move. The fat man nodded. If you turn to your left when you get out of here, you'll come to Cameron's in about three minutes. Bateman hesitated. I think I should tell you that Edward Barnard is my greatest friend. I was very much surprised when I heard he'd left Branschmidt's and company. The fat man's eyes contracted till they seemed like pin-ponds, and their scrutiny made Bateman so uncomfortable that he felt himself blushing. I guess Branschmidt's and company and Edward Barnard didn't see eye to eye on certain matters, he replied. Bateman did not quite like the fellow's manner, so he got up, not without dignity, and with an apology for troubling him, bade him good day. He left the place with a singular feeling that the man he had just interviewed had much to tell him, but no intention of telling it. He walked in the direction indicated, and soon found himself at Cameron's. It was a trader's store, such as he had passed half a dozen of on his way, and when he entered the first person he saw, in his shirt sleeves measuring out a length of trade cotton, was Edward. It gave him a start to see him engaged in so humble an occupation. But he had scarcely appeared when Edward, looking up, caught sight of him, and gave a joyful cry of surprise. Bateman, who ever thought of seeing you here? He stretched his arm across the counter and wrung Bateman's hand. There was no self-consciousness in his manner, and the embarrassment was all on Bateman's side. Just wait till I've wrapped this package. With perfect assurance, he ran his scissors across the stuff, folded it, made it into a parcel, and handed it to the dark-skinned customer. Pay at the desk, please. Then, smiling, with bright eyes, he turned to Bateman. How do you show up here? Gee, I'm delighted to see you. Sit down, old man. Make yourself at home. We can't talk here. Come along to my hotel. I suppose you can get away? This he added with some apprehension. Of course I can get away. We are not so businesslike as all that in Tahiti. He called out to a Chinese who was standing behind the opposite counter. Aling, when the boss comes, tell him a friend of mine's just arrived from America and I've gone out to have a drink with him. All right, said the Chinese with a grin. Edward slipped on a coat and putting on his hat, accompanied Bateman out of the store. Bateman attempted to put the matter facetiously. I didn't expect to find you selling three and a half yards of rotten cotton to a greasy nigger, he laughed. Branschmidt fired me, you know, and I thought that would do as well as anything else. Edward's candor seemed to Bateman's very surprising, but he thought it indiscreet to pursue the subject. I guess you won't make a fortune where you are, he answered, somewhat dryly. I guess not, but I earn enough to keep body and soul together, and I'm quite satisfied with that. You wouldn't have been two years ago. We grow wiser as we grow older, retorted Edward gaily. Bateman took a glance at him. Edward was dressed in a suit of shabby white ducks, none too clean, and a large straw hat of native made. He was thinner than he had been, deeply burned by the sun, and he was certainly better looking than ever. But there was something in his appearance that disconcerted Bateman. He walked with a new jauntiness. There was a carelessness in his demeanour, a gaiety about nothing in particular, which Bateman could not precisely blame, but which exceedingly puzzled him. I'm blessed if I can see what he's got to be so darned cheerful about, he said to himself. They arrived at the hotel and sat on the terrace. A Chinese boy brought them cocktails. Edward was most anxious to hear all the news of Chicago and bombarded his friend with eager questions. His interest was natural and sincere, but the odd thing was that it seemed equally divided among a multitude of subjects. He was as eager to know how Bateman's father was as what Isabel was doing. He talked of her without a shade of embarrassment, but she might just as well have been his sister as his promised wife. 
and before bateman had done analysing the exact meaning of edward's remarks he found that the conversation had drifted to his own work and the buildings his father had lately erected he was determined to bring the conversation back to isabel and was looking for the occasion when he saw edward wave his hand cordially a man was advancing towards them on the terrace but bateman's back was turned to him and he could not see him come and sit down said edward gaily the newcomer approached he was a very tall thin man in white ducks with a fine hat of curly white hair his face was thin too long with a large hooked nose and a beautiful expressive mouth this is my old friend bateman's hunter i've told you about him said edward his constant smile breaking on his lips i'm pleased to meet you mr hunter i used to know your father the stranger held out his hand and took the young man's in a strong friendly grasp it was not till then that edward mentioned the other's name mr arnold jackson bateman turned white and he felt his hands grow cold this was the forger the convict this was isabel's uncle he did not know what to say he tried to conceal his confusion arnold jackson looked at him with twinkling eyes i dare say my name is familiar to you bateman did not know whether to say yes or no and what made it more awkward was that both jackson and edward seemed to be amused it was bad enough to have forced on him the acquaintance of the one man on the island he would rather have avoided but worse to discern that he was being made a fool of perhaps however he had reached this conclusion too quickly for jackson without a pause added i understand you're very friendly with the longstaffs mary longstaff is my sister End of section four. Section five of the trembling of a leaf, but a beautiful set mom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The fall of Edward Barnard, part two. Now Bateman asked himself if Arnold Jackson could think him ignorant of the most terrible scandal that Chicago had ever known. But Jackson put his hand on Edward's shoulder. I can't sit down, Teddy, he said. I'm busy, but you two boys had better come up and die tonight. They'll be fine, said Edward. It's very kind of you, Miss Jackson, said Bateman, frigidly. But I'm here for so short a time. My boat sails tomorrow, you know. I think if you forgive me, I won't come. Oh, nonsense. I'll give you a native dinner. My wife's a wonderful cook. Teddy will show you the way. Come early, so as to see the sunset. I can give you both a shake down if you like. Of course we'll come, said Edward. There's always the devil of a row in the hotel on the night the boat arrives, and we can have a good yarn up at the bungalow. I can't let you off, Mr. Hunter, Jackson continued with the utmost cordiality. I want to hear all about Chicago and Mary. He nodded and walked away before Bateman could say another word. We don't take refusals in Tahiti, laughed Edward. Besides, you get the best dinner on the island. What did he mean by saying his wife was a good cook? I happen to know his wife's in Geneva. That's a long way off for a wife, isn't it? said Edward. And it's a long time since he saw her. I guess it's another wife he's talking about. For some time Bateman was silent. His face was set in grave lines, but looking up he caught the amused look in Edward's eyes, and he flushed darkly. Arnold Jackson is a despicable rope, he said. I greatly fear he is, answered Edward, smiling. I don't see how any decent man can have anything to do with him. Perhaps I'm not a decent man. Do you see much of him, Edward? Yes, quite a lot. He's adopted me as his nephew. Bateman leaned forward and fixed Edward with his searching eyes. Do you like him? Very much. But don't you know, doesn't everyone here know, that he's a forger and that he's been a convict? He ought to be handed out of civilized society. Edward watched the ring of smoke that floated from his cigar into the still scented air. I suppose he's a pretty and mitigated rascal he said at last and i can't flatter myself that any repentance for his misdeeds offers one an excuse for condoning them he was a swindler and a hypocrite you can't get away from it 
I never met a more agreeable companion. He's taught me everything I know. What has he taught you? cried Bateman in amazement. How to live? Bateman broke into ironical laughter. A fine master. Is it owing to his lessons that you lost the chance of making a fortune and earn your living now by serving behind a counter in a ten-cent store? He has a wonderful personality, said Edward, smiling good-naturedly. Perhaps you'll see what I mean tonight. I'm not going to die with him, if that's what you mean. Nothing would induce me to set foot within that man's house. Come to oblige me, Bateman. We've been friends for so many years. You won't refuse me a favour when I ask it. Edward's tone had in it a quality new to Bateman. Its gentleness was singularly persuasive. If you put it like that, Edward, I'm bound to come, he smiled. Bateman reflected, moreover, that it would be as well to learn what he could about Arnold Jackson. It was plain that he had a great ascendancy over Edward, and if it was to be combated, it was necessary to discover in what exactly it consisted. The more he talked with Edward, the more conscious he became that a change had taken place in him. He had an instinct that it behooved him to walk warily, and he made up his mind not to broach the real purport of his visit till he saw his way more clearly. He began to talk of one thing and another, of his journey and what he had achieved by it, of politics in Chicago, of this common friend and that, of their days together at college. At last, Edward said he must get back to his work and proposed that he should fetch Bateman at five so that they could drive out together to Arnold Jackson's house. By the way, I rather thought you'd be living at this hotel, said Bateman, as he strode out of the garden with Edward. I understand it's the only decent one here. Not I, laughed Edward. It's a deal too grand for me. I rent a room just outside the town. It's cheap and clean. If I remember right, those weren't the ponds that seemed most important to you when you lived in Chicago. Chicago? I don't know what you mean by that, Edward. It's the greatest city in the world. I know, said Edward. Bateman glanced at him quickly, but his face was inscrutable. When are you coming back to it? I often wonder, smiled Edward. This answer, and the manner of it, staggered Bateman. But before he could ask for an explanation, Edward waved to a half-caste who was driving a passing motor. Give us a ride down, Charlie, he said. He nodded to Bateman and ran after the machine that had pulled up a few yards in front. Bateman was left to piece together a mass of perplexing impressions. Edward called for him in a rickety trap drawn by an old mare, and they drove along a road that ran by the sea. On each side of it were plantations, coconut and vanilla, and now and then they saw a great mango, its fruit yellow and red and purple among the massy green of the leaves. Now and then they had a glimpse of the lagoon, smooth and blue, with here and there a tiny islet, graceful with tall palms. Arnold Jackson's house stood on a little hill, and only a path led to it, so they unharnessed the mare and tied her to a tree, leaving the trap by the side of the road. To Bateman it seemed a happy-go-lucky way of doing things, but when they went up to the house they were met by a tall, handsome native woman, no longer young. With him Edward cordially shook hands. He introduced Bateman to her. This is my friend Mr. Hunter. We're going to die with you, Lavina. All right, she said, with a quick smile. Arnold ain't back yet. We'll go down and bathe. Let us have a couple of pareos. The woman nodded and went into the house. Who is that? asked Bateman. Oh, there's Lavina. She's Arnold's wife. Bateman tightened his lips, but said nothing. In a moment, the woman returned with a bundle, which she gave to Edward, and the two men, scrambling down a steep path, made their way to a grove of coconut trees on the beach. They undressed, and Edward showed his friend how to make the strip of red tray cotton, which is called a pareo, into a very neat pair of bathing drawers. Soon they were splashing in the warm, shallow water. Edward was in great spirits. He laughed and shouted and sang. He might have been fifteen. Bateman had never seen him so gay, and afterwards, when they lay on the beach, smoking cigarettes, in the limpid air, there was such an irresistible light-heartedness in him that Bateman was taken aback. 
you seem to find life mighty pleasant said he i do they heard a soft movement and looking round saw that arnold jackson was coming towards them i thought i'd come down and fetch you two boys back he said do you enjoy your bath mr hunter very much said bateman arnold jackson no longer in spruce ducks wore nothing but a pareo round his loins and walked barefoot his body was deeply browned by the sun with his long curling white hair and his ascetic face he made a fantastic figure in the native dress but he bore himself without a trace of self-consciousness if you're ready we'll go right up said jackson i'll just put on my clothes said bateman why teddy didn't you bring a pareo for your friend i guess it rather wear clothes smiled edward i certainly would answered bateman grimly as he saw Edward gird himself into the loincloth and stand ready to start before he himself had got his shirt on. "'Won't you find it rough walking without your shoes?' he asked Edward. "'It struck me the path was a trifle rocky. Oh, I'm used to it. "'It's a comfort to get into a pareo when one gets back from town,' said Jackson. "'If you were going to stay here, I should strongly recommend you to adopt it.' It's one of the most sensible costumes I have ever come across. It's cool, convenient, and inexpensive. They walked up to the house, and Jackson took them into a large room with whitewashed walls and an open ceiling in which a table was laid for dinner. Bateman noticed that it was set for five. Eva, come and show yourself to Teddy's friend, and then shake us a cocktail, called Jackson. Then he led Bateman to a long, low window. Look at that, he said, with a dramatic gesture. Look well. Below them coconut trees tumbled down steeply to the lagoon, and the lagoon in the evening light had the colour, tender and varied, of a dove's breast. On a creek, at a little distance, were the clustered huts of a native village, and towards the reef was a canoe, sharply silhouetted, in which were a couple of natives fishing. Then, beyond, you saw the vast calmness of the Pacific, and twenty miles away, airy and unsubstantial, like the fabric of a poet's fancy, the unimaginable beauty of the island, which is called Muria. It was all so lovely that Bateman stood abashed. I have never seen anything like it, he said at last. Arnold Jackson stood staring in front of him, and in his eyes was a dreamy softness. His thin, thoughtful face was very grave. Bateman, glancing at it, was once more conscious of his intense spirituality. Beauty, murmured Arnold Jackson. You seldom see beauty face to face. Look at it well, Mr. Hunter, for what you see now you will never see again, since the moment is transitory, but it will be an imperishable memory in your heart. You touch eternity. His voice was deep and resonant. He seemed to breathe forth the purest idealism. And Bateman had to urge himself to remember that the man who spoke was a criminal and a cruel cheat. But Edward, as though he heard a sound, turned round quickly. Here is my daughter, Mr. Hunter. Bateman shook hands with her. She had dark, splendid eyes and a red mouth tremulous with laughter. But her skin was brown and her curling hair rippling down her shoulders was coal black she wore but one garment mother hubbard of pink cotton her feet were bare and she was crowned with a wreath of white scented flowers she was a lovely creature she was like a goddess of the polynesian spring she was a little shy but not more shy than bateman to whom the whole situation was highly embarrassing and it did not put him at his ease to see this sooth-like thing take a shaker and with the practised hand mix three cocktails let us have a kick in them child said jackson she poured them out and smiling delightfully handed one to each of the men bateman flattered himself on his skill in the subtle art of shaking cocktails and he was not a little astonished on tasting this one to find that it was excellent Jackson laughed proudly when he saw his guest's involuntary look of appreciation. Not bad, is it? I taught the child myself, 
and in the old days in chicago i considered that there wasn't a bartender in the city that could hold a candle to me when i had nothing better to do in the penitentiary i used to amuse myself by thinking out new cocktails but when you come down to brass tacks there is nothing to beat a dry martini bateman felt as though someone had given him a violent blow on the funny bone and he was conscious that he turned red and then white but before he could think of anything to say a native boy brought in a great bowl of soup and the whole party sat down to dinner arnold jackson's remark seemed to have aroused in him a train of recollections for he began to talk of his prison days he talked quite naturally without malice as though he were relating his experiences at a foreign university he addressed himself to bateman and bateman was confused and then confounded he saw edward's eyes fixed on him and there was in them a flicker of amusement he blushed scarlet for it struck him that jackson was making a fool of him and then because he felt absurd and knew there was no reason why he should he grew angry arnold jackson was impudent there was no other word for it and his callousness whether assumed or not was outrageous the dinner proceeded bateman was asked to eat sundry messes raw fish and he knew not what which only his civility induced him to swallow but which he was amazed to find very good eating then an incident happened which to bateman was the most mortifying experience of the evening there was a little circlet of flowers in front of him and for the sake of conversation he hazarded a remark about it it's a wreath that eva made for you said jackson but i guess she was too shy to give it you bateman took it up in his hand and made a polite little speech of thanks to the girl you must put it on she said with a smile and a blush i i don't think i'll do that it's the charming custom of the country said arnold jackson there was one in front of him and he placed it on his hair edward did the same i guess i'm not dressed for the part said bateman uneasily would you like a pareo said eva quickly i get you one in a minute no thank you i'm quite comfortable as i am show him how to put it on eva said edward at that moment bateman hated his greatest friend eva got up from the table and with much laughter placed the wreath on his black hair it suits you very well said mrs jackson don't it suit him arnold of course it does bateman sweated at every pore isn't it a pity it's dark said eva we could photograph you all three together bateman thanked his stars it was he felt that he must look prodigiously foolish in his blue serge suit and high collar very neat and gentlemanly with that ridiculous wreath of flowers on his head he was seething with indignation and he had never in his life exercised more self-control than now when he presented an affable exterior he was furious with that old man sitting at the head of the table half naked with his saintly face and the flowers on his handsome white locks the whole position was monstrous then dinner came to an end and eva and her mother remained to clear away while the three men sat on the veranda it was very warm and the air was scented with the white flowers of the night the full moon sailing across an unclouded sky made a pathway on the broad sea led to the boundless realms of forever arnold jackson began to talk his voice was rich and musical he talked now of the natives and of the old legends of the country he told strange stories of the past stories of hazardous expeditions into the unknown of love and death of hatred and revenge he told of the adventurers who had discovered those distant islands of the sailors who settling in them had married the daughters of great chieftains and of the beach combers who had led their varied lives on those silvery shores bateman mortified and exasperated at first listened sullenly but presently some magic in the words possessed him and he sat entranced the mirage of romance obscured the light of common day had he forgotten that arnold jackson had a tongue of silver a tongue by which 
he had charmed vast sums out of the credulous public a tongue which very nearly enabled him to escape the penalty of his crimes no one had a sweeter eloquence and no one had a more acute sense of climax suddenly he rose well you two boys haven't seen one another for a long time i shall leave you to have a yarn teddy will show you your quarters when you want to go to bed oh but i wasn't thinking of spending the night mr jackson said bateman you'll find him more comfortable we'll see that you're caught in good time then with a courteous shake of the hand stately as though he were a bishop in canonicals arnold jackson took leave of his guest of course i'll drive you back to papiti if you like said edward but i advise you to stay it's bully driving in the early morning for a few minutes neither of them spoke bateman wondered how he should begin on the conversation which all the events of the day made him think more urgent when are you coming back to chicago he asked suddenly for a moment edward did not answer then he turned rather lazily to look at his friend and smiled i don't know perhaps never what in heaven's name do you mean cried bateman i'm very happy here wouldn't it be folly to make a change men alive you can't live here all your life this is no life for a man it's a living death oh edward come away at once before it's too late i felt that something was wrong you're infatuated with the place you've succumbed to evil influences but it only requires a wrench and then you're free from these surroundings you'll thank all the gods there be you'll be like a dope fiend when he's broken from his drug you see then that for two years you've been breathing poisoned air you can't imagine what a relief it will be when you fill your lungs once more with the fresh pure air of your native country he spoke quickly the words tumbling over one another in his excitement and there was in his voice sincere and affectionate emotion edward was touched it is good of you to care so much old friend come with me to-morrow edward it was a mistake that you ever came to this place this is no life for you you talk of this sort of life and that how do you think a man gets the best out of life why i should have thought there could be no two answers to that by doing his duty by hard work by meeting all the obligations of his state and station and what is his reward his reward is the consciousness of having achieved what he set out to do it all sounds a little portentous to me said edward and in the lightness of the night bateman could see that he was smiling i'm afraid you will think i have degenerated sadly there are several things i think now which i dare say would have seemed outrageous to me three years ago have you learnt them from arnold jackson asked bateman scornfully you don't like him perhaps you couldn't be expected to i didn't when i first came i had just the same prejudice as you he's a very extraordinary man you saw for yourself that he makes no secret of the fact that he was in the penitentiary i did not know that he regrets it or the crimes that led him there the only complaint he ever made in my hearing was that when he came out his health was impaired i think he does not know what remorse is he is completely unmoral he accepts everything and he accepts himself as well he is generous and kind he always was interrupted bateman on other people's money i found him a very good friend is it unnatural that i should take a man as i find him the result is that you lose the distinction between right and wrong no they remain just as clearly divided in my mind as before but what has become a little confused in me is the distinction between the bad man and the good one is arnold jackson a bad man who does good things or a good man who does bad things it's a difficult question to answer perhaps we make too much of the difference between one man and another perhaps even the best of us are sinners and the worst of us are saints who knows you will never persuade me that white is black and that black is white said bateman i'm sure i shan't bateman bateman could not understand why the flicker of a smile crossed edward's lips when he thus agreed with him edward was silent for a minute when i saw you this morning bateman he said then 
I seemed to see myself as I was two years ago. The same collar, the same shoes, the same blue suit, the same energy. The same determination. By God, I was energetic. The sleepy methods of this place made my blood tingle. I went about and everywhere I saw possibilities for development and enterprise. There were fortunes to be made here. It seemed to me absurd that the copra should be taken away from here in sacks and the oil extracted in America. It would be far more economical to do all that on the spot, with cheap labour, and save freight. And I saw already the fast factories springing up on the island, and the way they extracted it from the coconut seemed to me hopelessly inadequate. And I invented a machine which divided a nut and scooped out the meat at the rate of two hundred and forty an hour. The harbour was not large enough. I made plans to enlarge it, then to form a syndicate to buy land, put up two or three large hotels and bungalows for occasional residents. I had a scheme for improving the steamer surface in order to attract visitors from California. In twenty years, instead of this half-French lazy little town of Papiti, I saw a great American city with ten-story buildings and streetcars, a theatre and an opera house, a stock exchange and a mayor. But go ahead, Edward, cried Bateman, springing up from the chair in excitement. You've got the ideas and the capacity. Why? you become the richest man between Australia and the States. Edward chuckled softly. But I don't want to, he said. Do you mean to say you don't want money? Big money? Money running into millions? Do you know what you can do with it? Do you know the power it brings? And if you don't care about it for yourself, think what you can do. Opening new channels for human enterprise giving occupation to thousands, my brain reels at the visions or words have conjured up. Sit down then, my dear Bateman, laughed Edward. My machine for cutting the coconuts will always remain unused. And so far as I am concerned, streetcars shall never run in the idle streets of Papiti. Bateman sank happily into his chair. I don't understand you, he said. It came upon me little by little. I came to like the life here, with its ease and its leisure, and the people, with their good nature and their happy smiling faces. I began to think I'd never had time to do that before. I began to read. You always read. I read for examinations. I read in order to be able to hold my own in conversation. I read for instruction. Here I learned to read for pleasure. I learned to talk. Do you know that conversation is one of the greatest pleasures in life? But it wants leisure. I'd always been too busy before, and gradually all the life that had seemed so important to me began to seem rather trivial and vulgar. What is the use of all this hustle and this constant striving? I think of Chicago now, and I see a dark, grey city, all stone. It is like a prison, and a ceaseless turmoil. And what does all that activity amount to? Does one get there the best out of life? Is that what we come into the world for? To hurry to an office and work hour after hour till night, then hurry home and die and go to a theatre? Is that how I must spend my youth? Youth lasts so short a time, Bateman. And when I am old, what have I to look forward to? to hurry from my home in the morning to my office and work hour after hour till night and then hurry home again and die and go to a theatre. That may be worthwhile if you make a fortune. I don't know. It depends on your nature. But if you don't, is it worthwhile then? I want to make more out of my life than that, Bateman. What do you value in life then? I'm afraid you'll laugh at me. Beauty, truth and goodness. Don't you think you can have those in Chicago? Some men can, perhaps, but not I. Edward sprang up now. I tell you when I think of the life I led in the old days, I'm filled with horror. He cried violently. I tremble with fear when I think of the danger I have escaped. I never knew I had a soul till I found it here. If I had remained a rich man, I might have lost it, for good and all. I don't know how you can say that cried Bateman indignantly. We often used to have discussions about it. Yes, I know, 
they were about as effectual as the discussions of deaf mutes about harmony i shall never come back to chicago bateman and what about isabel edward walked to the edge of the veranda and leaning over looked intently at the blue magic of the night there was a slight smile on his face when he turned back to bateman isabel is infinitely too good for me i admire her more than any woman i have ever known she has a wonderful brain and she's as good as she's beautiful i respect her energy and her ambition she was born to make a success of life i am entirely unworthy of her she doesn't think so but you must tell her so bateman i cried bateman i'm the last person who could ever do that edward had his back to the vivid light of the moon and his face could not be seen is it possible that he smiled again it's no good your trying to conceal anything from her bateman with her quick intelligence she'll turn you inside out in five minutes you'd better make a clean breast of it right away i don't know what you mean of course i shall tell her i've seen you bateman spoke in some agitation honestly i don't know what to say to her tell her that i haven't made good tell her that i am not only poor but that i am content to be poor tell her i was fired from my job because i was idle and inattentive tell her all you've seen to-night and all i've told you the idea which on a sudden flashed through bateman's brain brought him to his feet and in uncontrollable perturbation he faced edward man alive don't you want to marry her edward looked at him gravely i can never ask her to release me if she wishes to hold me to my word i will do my best to make her a good and loving husband do you wish me to give her that message edward oh i can't it's terrible it's never dawned on her for a moment that you don't want to marry her she loves you how can i inflict such a mortification on her edward smiled again why don't you marry her yourself bateman you've been in love with her for ages you're perfectly suited to one another you make her very happy don't talk to me like that i can't bear it i resign in your favour bateman you are the better man there was something in edward's tone that made bateman look up quickly but edward's eyes were grave and unsmiling bateman did not know what to say he was disconcerted he wondered whether edward could possibly suspect that he had come to tahiti on a special errand and though he knew it was horrible he could not prevent the exultation in his heart what will you do if isabel writes and puts an end to her engagement with you he said slowly survive said edward bayman was so agitated that he did not hear the answer i wish you had ordinary clothes on he said somewhat irritably it's such a tremendously serious decision you are making the fantastic costume of yours makes it seem terribly casual i assure you i can be just as solemn in a pareo and a wreath of roses as in a high hat and cutaway coat then another thought struck bateman edward it's not for my sake you're doing this i don't know but perhaps this is going to make a tremendous difference to my future you're not sacrificing yourself for me i couldn't stand for that you know no bateman i have learned not to be silly and sentimental here i should like you and isabel to be happy but i have not the least wish to be unhappy myself the answer somewhat chilled bateman it seemed to him a little cynical he would not have been sorry to act a noble part do you mean to say you are content to waste your life here it's nothing less than suicide when i think of the great hopes you had when we left college it seems terrible that you should be content to be no more than a salesman in a cheap john store oh i'm only doing that for the present and i'm gaining a great deal of valuable experience i have another plan in my head arnold jackson has a small island in the pomotas about a thousand miles from here a ring of land round a lagoon he has planted coconut there he has offered to give it me why should he do that asked bateman because if isabel releases me i shall marry his daughter you bateman was thunderstruck you can't marry a half-caste you wouldn't be so crazy as that 
She's a good girl, and she has a sweet and gentle nature. I think she would make me very happy. Are you in love with her? I don't know, answered Edward reflectively. I'm not in love with her as I was in love with Isabel. I worshipped Isabel. I thought she was the most wonderful creature I had ever seen. I was not half good enough for her. I don't feel like that with Eva. She's like a beautiful exotic flower that must be sheltered from bitter winds. I want to protect her. No one ever thought of protecting Isabel. I think she loves me for myself, and not for what I may become. Whatever happens to me, I shall never disappoint her. She suits me. Bayman was silent. We must turn out early in the morning, said Edward at last. It's really about time we went to bed. Then Bayman spoke, and his voice had in it a genuine distress. I'm so bewildered. I don't know what to say. I came here because I thought something was wrong. I thought you hadn't succeeded in what you set out to do, and were ashamed to come back when you'd failed. I never guessed I should be faced with this. I'm so desperately sorry, Edward. I'm so disappointed. I hoped you would do great things. It's almost more than I can bear to think of you wasting your talents and your youth and your charms in this lamentable way. Don't be grieved, old friend, said Edward. I haven't failed. I've succeeded. You can't think with what zest I look forward to life, how full it seems to me, and how significant. Sometimes, when you are married to Isabel, you will think of me. I shall build myself a house on my coral island, and I shall live there, looking after my trees, getting the fruit out of the nuts in the same old way that they have done for unnumbered years. I shall grow all sorts of things in my garden, and I shall fish. There will be enough work to keep me busy and not enough to make me dull. I shall have my books and Eva, children, I hope, and above all, the infinite variety of the sea and the sky, the freshness of the dawn and the beauty of the sunset, and the rich magnificence of the night. I shall make a garden out of what so short a while ago was a wilderness. I shall have created something. The years will pass insensibly. And when I am an old man, I hope that I shall be able to look back on a happy, simple, peaceful life. In my small way, I too shall have lived in beauty. Do you think it is so little to have enjoyed contentment? We know that it will profit a man little if he gain the whole world and lose his soul. I think I have one mine. Edward led him to a room in which there were two beds, and he threw himself on one of them. In ten minutes, Bayman knew by his regular breathing, peaceful as a child's, that Edward was asleep. For his part, he had no rest. He was disturbed in mind, and it was not till the dawn crept into the room, ghost-like and silent, that he fell asleep. Bayman finished telling Isabel his long story. He had hidden nothing from her, except what he thought would wound her, or what made himself ridiculous. He did not tell her that he had been forced to sit at dinner with a wreath of flowers round his head, and he did not tell her that Edward was prepared to marry her uncle's half-caste daughter the moment she set him free. But perhaps Isabel had cleaner intuitions than he knew, for as he went on with his tale, her eyes grew colder, and her lips closed upon one another more tightly. Now and then she looked at him closely and if he had been less intent on his narrative, he might have wondered at her expression. What was this girl like? she asked, when he finished. Uncle Arnold's daughter, would you say there was any resemblance between her and me? Bateman was surprised at the question. It never struck me. You know I've never had eyes for anyone but you, and I could never think that anyone was like you. Who could resemble you? Was she pretty? said Isabel smiling slightly at his words. I suppose so. I dare say some men would say she was very beautiful. Well, it's of no consequence. I don't think we need give her any more of our attention. What are you going to do, Isabel? He asked then. Isabel looked down at a hand which still bore the ring Edward had given her on their betrothal. I wouldn't let Edward break our engagement because I thought it would be an incentive to him. I wanted to be an inspiration to him. I thought if anything could enable him to achieve success, it was the thought that I loved him. I have done all I could. It's hopeless. 
It would only be weakness on my part not to recognize the facts. Poor Edward. He's nobody's enemy but his own. He was a dear, nice fellow, but there was something lacking in him. I suppose it was backbone. I hope he'll be happy. She slipped the ring off her finger and placed it on the table. Bateman watched her, with a heart beating so rapidly that he could hardly breathe. You're wonderful, Isabel. You're simply wonderful. She smiled, and standing up, held out her hand to him. How can I ever thank you for what you've done for me? She said. You've done me a great service. I knew I could trust you. He took her hand and held it. She had never looked more beautiful. Oh, Isabel, I would do so much more for you than that. You know that I only ask to be allowed to love and serve you. You're so strong, Bayman, she sighed. It gives me such a delicious feeling of confidence. Isabel, I adore you. He hardly knew how the inspiration had come to him, but suddenly he clasped her in his arms, and she, all unresisting, smiled into his eyes. Isabel, you know I wanted to marry you the very first day I saw you, he cried passionately. Then why on earth didn't you ask me? She replied. She loved him. He could hardly believe it was true. She gave him her lovely lips to kiss, and as he held her in his arms, he had a vision of the works of the Hunter Motor Traction and Automobile Company growing in size and importance till they covered a hundred acres, and of the millions of motors they would turn out, and of the great collection of pictures they would form, which should beat anything they had in New York. He would wear horn spectacles, and she, with the delicious pressure of his arms about her, sighed with happiness, for she thought of the exquisite house she would have, full of antique furniture, and of the concerts she would give, and of the thé d'anson, and the dinners to which only the most cultured people would come. Bateman should wear horn spectacles. Poor Edward, she sighed. End of section 5